With microbiomes uh, based solutions, you can strike a balance because you can be productive and you, be sustain you are sustainable at the same time. So you can have food products, you can have medicinal products. There are a lot of solutions that are actually also applicable uh, and can, can be scaled up uh, in developing countries. And so part of our job is actually to make this happen. What we do is we develop tools that allow to, um, let me put it this way, to listen to the crosstalk or the dialogue between bacteria and human cells. We know still relatively little about the functions and the, in the interactions with higher organisms, but also the microbial interactions. So how do the microbiome members interact with each other? A microbiome describes the composition and interaction of microorganisms with each other and their environment. Exploring and understanding this mostly unknown world has become a growing field in science, and that for a good reason. In this film, we want to take you on a journey across Europe to some of the places where microbiome research happens and show the many ways in which microbiomes impact our daily life. Amsterdam in the Netherlands. It was here where a textile salesman pushed the door open into the universe of microbial organisms for the first time. The very first uh, observations of microbes, uh, that was by uh, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century. He constructed his own microscopes, tiny microscopes, but uh, with a very, uh, let's say, uh, impressive uh, resolution because he was able to see even bacteria. Tiny creatures that he was able to observe for the first time through these home-built microscopes. And it was only 200 years later, by the work of uh, Pasteur in France and Koch in, uh, in Germany, that people started to realize the impact of microbial life. The tiny beasts Van Leeuwenhoek mentioned can be seen at the Amsterdam Zoo, where in 2014, Remco Court and his team established Micropia, the world's first zoo for microbes. Well, I think there's no better, better place for a, a microbe museum than in a zoo because already uh, we, we, this is the place to learn a lot about uh, uh, life on this planet. And actually there's a very big uh, part missing because the, well, not, not only the early life form but also the most predominant life forms on this planet are microbes. Therefore it's, it's an excellent idea to put such a museum right here in Artis in the zoo. So we have about uh, 200 living species that are on display in the zoo. And the interesting thing is that we, uh, we keep them alive and cultivate them in the laboratory, which is uh, present of the zoo. So going in Micropia, you can see uh, the technicians at work in keeping our al collection alive. A collection that may never be completed. The number of microorganisms out there can only be estimated. So this is called the Tree of Life, so it's a representation of all life on, uh, on Earth. And uh, it's based on a single molecule, the RNA molecule, which is present in every living creature. So by comparing this molecule, or the sequence of this molecule, of all the life forms, we can construct a tree, because we can see this organism is more related to this one to another one. And based on all these relationships, we can make a tree showing what's the, the, the distance of one organism to the other. So this tree gives you insight that the, 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 the major uh, the dominance of life is actually invisible. The introduction of RNA sequencing technology was a game changer in the discovery of new microorganisms. The tree of life showed many new branches that could not be found before for a simple reason. Our knowledge was based on those organisms that we could cultivate in the laboratory. I think our gut is a very nice example of that because we have been looking at E. coli, the intestinal bacterium. It was a model organism. It still is because it grows excellent in the laboratory. And then by using the, the, the RNA methodology with these molecules, looking at what's inside the gut, we found that E. coli is only a minor of the bacteria and that there are many organisms present for which we do not have the cultivation uh, capability in the lab.
the fact that microorganisms can be found almost everywhere is illustrated by an interactive installation, the body scanner. It, uh, it starts with a scan and uh, this indicates a number of 100 trillion microbes. So it's, it's amazing the number that habitates our body. This allows you to get an impression from the number of microorganisms that reside inside and on top of your body. Next to the scan, you're allowed to uh, make a trip through your body, zoom in on different organs. It's, it's interactive, so you, with your hands you can uh, uh, navigate uh, through the human body, go to all different body sites, check the, the oral microbiome or the gut microbiome, and then for each of these body sites we highlighted a number of uh, microorganisms and uh, tell stories about their specific functions. So I think it's very good for people to realize that in our daily life we carry with us uh, hundreds of trillions of microorganisms and they are essential for our daily life. And do not focus exclusively on those microorganisms that cause infectious diseases. Of course, the, the, well, the, the feedback of every person is different, but we heard a lot that uh, a new world opened to them. So a lot, it, it raised a lot of awareness. And then realizing that we have over uh, 100,000 visitors a year, I think that this museum contributes a lot to the microbial literacy, so to say. Alfred Grand from Absdorf, Austria, is a farmer looking for new ways to reduce the use of fertilizers, for a good reason. This intense production means we are very effective. But as a result, we have doubled the total amount of nitrogen in the biological cycle over the last decades. The excess nitrogen, however, causes huge problems. In order to reduce the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers in the future, it is necessary to regenerate the microbiomes in the soil. The regenerative approach aims to bring the soil organisms back to the plants again. The microbiome community of microorganisms is provided to the plants as a tool, so the plant can decide itself which nutrients it needs, which nutrients are mobilized in the soil. And this is done via the soul organisms. The Grand Garden is an experimental space where, together with scientists, methods to improve the soil microbiome are tested. We are going to take a look what such a soil can look like. And man sieht here. Uh, here we can see how crumbly the soil is, thereby I get lots of air into the soil and the roots are very well able to feed the soil organisms. If there is a lot of soil attached to the roots, it is a good sign that the communication between plant and soil organisms work well, that a lot of nutrients are available. Fertile soil starts with compost. The compost factory at the Grand Farm engages a special workforce to grow the desperately needed microbiome, earthworms. Why do we appoint earthworms as employees and not humans? Because humans cannot produce soil. But earthworms, together with soil organisms, with bacteria, with fungi, with protozoan, with nematodes, can produce soil. Usually marketed to hobby gardeners as humus, together with scientists from the AIT, the Austrian Institute of Technology, the Grand Farm explores a more efficient method to bring the soil microbiome to the plants, coating the seeds. I had to distribute 10 tons of compost to spread the microbiome. Today, I only place the microbes on the seeds and the plant as soon as the seeds germinate and the root, uh, so to say, emerges from the seed, it touches the surface, grabs the microbiomes and transports them into the soil. 
Das heißt, das ist für mich ein Transport. This means to me, it is a transport system for the microbiome that also rears the microbes that then in turn feed the plants. Und It's a transport and rearing station within the soil. And so, I can adapt the soil with only a tiny, tiny number of microorganisms. Angela Sesic and her team developed an even more advanced method that can better preserve the microorganisms by injecting them directly into the seeds. We found that when the microbes are inside, then the colonization of this microbe in the whole plant is much better than when we apply uh, the microorganisms outside of the seed. Yeah, and here the microorganisms are uh, injected into the seed in a way that it doesn't hurt the seed in terms of uh, seed development and germination and so forth. In addition to the method itself, there was also a machine developed that can inject the seeds on a larger scale. Seed vaccination can be seen as a promising technology to unleash the potential of a microbiome-driven agriculture. This is just a delivery approach and, and the microbe brings in the function. Yeah? So if the microbe is designed for uh, certain biocontrol activities against diseases, then of course the expectation is that the plant will perform better in terms of uh, disease tolerance. And if it uh, has another fu function, then it, uh, the plant is expected to do something else. So that's just a delivery and the function comes with the microbe. The Biomin Research Center in Thun, Austria, is helping farmers to improve the health and growth of their livestock. In order to do so, they are after the animal's microbiomes. So we develop feed additives that promote um, the gut health, so that have a positive effect on the microbiome. Feed additives have a long tradition in human as well as in animal nutrition. By using science, what happened to be a game of trial and error in the past becomes a precise application with reliable results. With the growing research, we understand much better which strains we should use and which strains give really, um, which are really beneficial for the microbiome. So, there are billions of strains out there. But where can we find the useful strains for the gut microbiome? We are getting them from the animals and from the animals' gut microbiome. So there we try to isolate them, get the nice strains with good abilities, good features, and make them then to our probiotic products. In a laborious lab procedure, the gut microbiome of the desired animals is diluted and regrown until single strains can be cultivated in the petri dish. The next step is to test the isolated strains, for example, against pathogens. We are growing a pathogen, uh, we are adding the strains uh, on separately, and then we look if one of those is inhibiting the growth of the pathogen. By this, a simple strain becomes a product. The time for mass production has come. Fermentation is a, basically a mass cultivation of microorganisms in a controlled environment. Um, so we, we cultivate them in bioreactors or fermenters and in these special vessels we can control the temperature, the pH value, we can supply nutrients and um, in this environment then the microorganisms can grow. Pushing fermentation to an industrial scale is a step-by-step -step process. First we go from one litre to this 20-litre fermenter here in the back. There we can test whether the process that we first developed in lab scale also works out a little bit bigger. And we can also at this stage already produce some first prototype of a new product. So because we need very early in the product development already um, material to do our, our feeding trials, our stability trials, toxicity trials, and yeah, all what we need for the registration of a new product. So, thanks to science, the properties of the microbiota within the food additive are well known, in contrast to the livestock's microbiome. We know basically more about the far side of the moon than we know about the gut microbiota in livestock. You can download the moon map, you can fly over the surface of the moon, and every single feature features on that far side of the moon is labeled, categorized, cataloged. 
we are lacking anything close to this when it comes to the gut microbiota in the livestock, but things are changing. Makdi Gambari and his team developed a tool to analyze the gut microbiome of livestock on site. In a close collaboration with farmers, samples are taken and analyzed, enabling to specifically modify and improve the livestock's microbiome. My vision for, for the farm, especially for our livestock farm, was to grow animals without using any type of antibiotics. Um, I'm very much focused also on the use of, of feed additives such as probiotics, and this is what connected me to this project. Inside the hen house, right beneath the livestock, a state-of-the-art molecular biology lab is set up. After a short time, the machines are ready to go. This is a fecal material collected from the um, chicken, I mean from the building material of chicken. And uh, so we're going to investigate the microbiota composition uh, within the samples and also look for the load of antibiotic resistant genes. Next generation sequencing is a new technology that no longer requires to cultivate microorganisms in order to detect them. The devices are able to extract and instantly read the DNA of the organisms the sample contains. So by using that method you can get information about all the microorganisms including bacteria, fungi, archaea, phage and also uh, if there is a parasite you can also detect as long as it has a DNA in the samples. It's faster, it's higher, like the sensitivity is much higher and also the precision it definitely is, is much higher compared to other conventional or culture dependent methods. The results can instantly be presented and discussed with a the farmer. They give in-depth information about the status of the gut microbiome and which food additives may or may not be applied in order to improve the health and the growth of the animals. These beneficial bacteria start growing in their digestive tract. And there is a principle where, where there is a good guy there cannot be a bad guy. And this is the principle we are following here. We try to limit the growth of the pathogens, of the, of the, of the disease-making bacteria, and uh, by, by yeah, the competition with the good ones. And with this probiotic, we bring a lot of good ones into uh, to avoid, um, to avoid these, these diseases, yes. In Servit, Belgium, Caldus Matt's work is centered around one of the earliest microbiome applications in history, sourdough. The very first breads, the very first fermented breads ever baked on earth were sourdough breads. For thousands of years, humans have used sourdough until in 1854, Louis Pasteur writes his Memoirs sur la fermentation alcoolique, where he describes how to isolate and how to produce yeast on a commercial base. Baking with yeast pretty soon replaced the use of a complicated and diverse sourdough microbiome, and for good reason. There is a book from Augustin Parmentier from 1778 that states that uh, I feel sad for the bakers because they are artists, but they are slaves of their sourdough because they have to feed it every four hours with water and flour and as such cannot sleep longer than three hours and a half in a row. So Louis Pasteur makes it simple. He isolates the yeast from the sourdough and, and makes it possible to sell it as a commercial item that bakers can use straight from the fridge in the dough and they can make more breads in less time. Unlike conventional yeast only bread, sourdough bread can differ a lot, not only in taste, but in many other ways. Facing the loss of this diversity, De Smet collaborates with bakers and scientists around the world, building up a library, preserving and exploring the world of sourdoughs and what they can do. The sourdough library, the very first thing we have to know about is that it is a non-for-profit initiative. Nevertheless, we have a couple of sourdoughs here that are coming from customers. I got this one from Tokyo in Japan. 
and it was a sourdough that has back, it goes back to 1875. So this sourdough has cooked rice inside, which creates a completely different microbiome inside than in a regular sourdough. And it's used to make a, a very famous bread called anpan. This sourdough is a sourdough I picked up back in 2018 in Seattle on a small island at uh, Bainbridge Island from a pizzeria. This sourdough is containing three strains of yeast and six types of lactic acid bacteria, which makes it the most biodiverse sourdough of all that we have in this library. Does that mean that it is the best sourdough? We don't know, but these are things that we can study. Keeping the many sourdoughs that were collected in glasses is a way to present them to visitors. The real preservation happens in a different way. This is just the showroom. The most important thing that happens when we collect the sourdough is that we, we send a piece of it to the University of Bolzano, where Marco and his team are going to dilute dilute the sourdough and then they inoculate these petri dishes. That takes about three months before they are able to isolate each and every microorganism that grows on these substrates. Then these are placed into these, these little tubes that are then placed in boxes like this and that they go in a freezer at minus 80 degrees. That's what we call preservation of the biodiversity. As a sourdough is a living ecosystem, it can easily be lost. For the bakeries that contribute to the collection, the library can be a lifesaver. I had last year a phone call from the owner of number 76 over there. He's Hendrik. I said, what happened, Hendrik? He says, my baker, he used all the mother dough all the mother dough in the production and the bread is already baked. I lost my mother. So I took his sample, gave it a feed, added water and flour to it. I sent him back a piece of his sourdough and he has his mother back. The sourdough library also includes a bakery. In order to further investigate its nutritional properties as bread, samples can be produced and sent to partner universities. Being in the oven, the microbiome reaches its highest activity, while at the same time ceases to exist. The microorganisms are dying and then the gluten network will denaturate, it will unleach its water and then the starch will absorb all this water that comes free and available. It will absorb the water, it will gelatinize and that's the moment that the dough will become the crumb and then we bake a little bit longer in order to obtain a nice crust. And if you leave that to cool, well, you have one of the most spectacular foods in human history. The University of Bolzano, Italy. Here, Professor Gorbetti and his team are running research on food fermentation and microbiomes. We have to know that foods and nutrients are the nourishment for humans, but at the same time they are the nourishment for microbes which are living with us at the gastrointestinal level since the first day of our life. Our gut microbiome is more than just some bacteria. They prevent the presence of uh, microbial pathogens. They help us on the developing of our immune system. They help us on the digestion and absorption of nutrients. And they help us in the energy intake after consumption of foods. The performance of our gut microbiome is very much influenced by our diet. Fermented food, therefore, can play an important role. Probably fermented foods have not the capability to drastically change the composition of the gut microbiota, but certainly they should have the capability to 
a guide to drive the functionality. In cooperation with the sourdough library in Savit, Professor Gabetti and his team investigate the impact that a sourdough fermented bread may have on our gut microbiome. In order to do so, they use a digestion machine, the artificial gut. Here we have three uh, parallel gastrointestinal tract. This first bioreactor represents a stomach and a small intestine. And these two bioreactors reproduce the proximal colon and the distal colon of this first gastrointestinal tract. The same we have in uh, the other two shame lines. So stomach, small intestine two, proximal colon, distal colon two. Stomach, small intestine three, proximal colon, distal colon three. So here we have three gastrointestinal tracts that are running in parallel. In order to feed the artificial gut, the food has to be prepared in the lab, a process similar to chewing and in salivation. Once prepared, the meal can be connected to the system. Feeding can start. Three times a day, we pump a quantity of this digested food inside uh, the system. So first in the stomach, the first bioreactor, and then the machine uh, mm, reproduce the transit of food has inside the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, after a resident time inside the stomach and the small intestine, the machine pump a quantity of pancreatic juice inside the bioreactor, and so we get a mixture, digested food and uh, pancreatic juice. This mixture will be transferred to the colon, where the food uh, can be in contact with the gut microbiota. After a digestion process of about four hours, all three digestion lines share the same toilet. In fact, the three different shine lines are transferring the waste in the same tank because we don't aim to analyze. But in other experiments, with other experimental design, we can um, divide different ways from the three different line and we can analyze also the waste, of course. Testing food digestion in a synthetic gut has many advantages compared to doing the same in living people. Diet and conditions can be precisely controlled and last but not least, it's much easier to take samples from every stage of digestion. What we can do? Uh, first of all, we extract the DNA from this microbial community and we investigate who is present, the quantity for, this micro, for every microorganism and the genome of this microorganism. So we can analyze, we can investigate what this microbial community is potentially able to do. Another important point is uh, we study the metabolites they produce, so the metabolites that concentrate inside the bioreactor. And this is also important because this kind of metabolite can can play a role for our health. Creating insights on the impact of fermented food on our health is a field that is not only of growing scientific importance. The artificial gut may also serve industry in the future. Until uh, five, seven, eight years ago, they were mostly interested in improving the sensory properties, in increasing the shelf life. Since seven, eight years ago, almost all industries want to improve the nutritional features of foods. And this is strictly related to the consumer requests. The village of Rohrbach in Austria has a problem with contaminated groundwater. We are at the site. It was a former tannery where people used chlorinated hydrocarbons and the chlorinated hydrocarbons contaminated the ground, the soil and the groundwater. A problem for which Thomas Reichenauer and his team from the Austrian Institute of Technology may have a solution. We are running a field experiment to investigate microbial uh, dechlorination of chlorinated ethenes. These were substances that were used in this uh, tanning process. 
the idea is to get rid of these chlorinated ethanes with the help of specific bacteria that are able to digest these compounds that are already there. So the degradation of contaminants normally is done by a microbiome. Um, there is one star often in this microbiome, so th this is the, the strain that really does the degradation. But this only can work if other uh, strains are producing substances that are also needed by this degrading strain for doing its work. By enhancing their growth, the process of degradation of the contaminant could be accelerated. So uh, we are adding molasses, so it's more or less sugar water uh, to the groundwater. Uh, and this uh, is a carbon source and energy source for the bacteria that then are able to uh, degrade these uh, contaminants, these chlorinated hydrocarbons. And the uh, final product is then a non-chlorinated hydrocarbon, which can easily be degraded by other microorganisms to CO2 and water. What sounds like a great idea needs to be tested in the field. After adding the nutrient to the site, the groundwater is constantly monitored. Well, there is a box over there and we have uh, consoles, uh, recording devices and the data are stored over there and we have to uh, get the data each week when we are here. We are measuring four parameters oxygen, electrical conductivity, pH, and the redox potential. In addition to the on-site monitoring, samples from the groundwater are taken for further analysis. We, we fill the, the groundwater in, in several bottles and cool these bottles and bring them uh, immediately to the laboratory. <laughs> Keeping the samples cool is important, as the bacterial growth process is very much influenced by temperature. Warming the water would lead to instant growth, thus distorting the results. Uh, we are looking for the cell numbers of a certain bacterium, in that case it's the Halococcoides. That's the bacterium that is able to dechlorinate our chlorinated hydrocarbons. The genetical analysis will show to what extent the addition of nutrients could influence the microbial growth and, if so, reduce the contamination of the groundwater. In a first step, the samples are taken to the lab. The DNA is extracted. And with this DNA, we can then proceed and make PCRs or qPCRs to quantify and identify what we find. The results are promising, as the long-term observation shows a clear trend. You can see that the, uh, the contaminant was high at the beginning, and after the treatment, the contaminant is decreasing. It shows that the uh, bacterium was really active in degrading or dechlorinating our product. Utilising microbiomes for the remediation of contaminated sites is a growing field. With the availability of gene analysis, the build-up of an arsenal of helpful microbiomes can start. We uh, uh, take samples from several uh, contaminated sites uh, across Europe and the aim is to isolate and characterize microbiomes for different contaminants and also to store these mic microbiomes uh, so that we can provide them to other researchers um, for further research and I'm convinced that, that microbiomes will be, become more and more important also in the biological remediation of contaminated sites. The world of microbiomes is on us, in us, and around us. Barely known in the past, they were seen as a deadly threat. The better we get to know them, the more we are able to change this microbial wilderness into a useful garden. We have to think differently and to understand that we are symbiosis, so we cannot just consider the human part anymore. Utilising microbiomes can help us to solve issues in an almost unlimited number of ways. It's good for the environment, it's good for the farmer, it's very good for the, the, the industry and also it's good for the consumers. 
Microbiome Research, therefore, is just taking its first steps on a long, promising journey.